Hi, everyone. I'm Candace Morgan, and I lead equity, diversity, and inclusion here at GV. And I'm so thrilled to announce a new series where we'll be having conversations on diversity in VC and the tech ecosystem, which is especially poignant this year in 2020. The first of our conversations will be with Tyson Clark, GV general partner, and Sydney Sykes, co-founder of Black VC, with their Breaking Into Venture community. And if you have any questions or suggestions of what we should talk about next, tweet at us. Thanks. Do you think, Tyson, that it's gotten different or better since you got into venture, that it's gotten a little bit more open and transparent? You know, we're in a, we're in a new place. We actually are in a new place, which is amazing. I think where um, it doesn't matter if you went to B school, first of all, that's, that's a new paradigm. It used to be you had to go to Stanford or Wharton or HBS, and that was the only way in. And nowadays, it's just not like it's not like that. Uh, it truly is more of a meritocracy. And also, I think um, in the past kind of five years, or maybe six years or seven years, but uh, it's more about kind of um, people who can actually add value day one, especially kind of the you know VP or principal level hiring. Uh, you know, and so so a lot of these people end up being people who come from product management backgrounds uh, at Google or Facebook or Instagram. Um, a lot of these companies are kind of like you know sort of top tier up and coming companies. Um, you know, where, where, where people cut their teeth building product. And that has, in my humble opinion, opened up the industry in a way that, uh, that, you know, that we haven't seen before. It's no longer just sort of this like, ne you know, nepotistic, I know someone, uh, you know, I have a cousin who wants to be in venture capital. It's now more of, I know someone who worked in data science, <laughs> you know, at Airbnb, mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, this person was a product manager. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and, um, it's twofold. I mean, so so one is that those those roles, PM and data science manager, uh, or data science you know expert, uh, tend to not be people of color. On the other side of that, at least it's not nepotistic, right? And so there's two ways to look at this. And if we can find the right people to sort of put in front of uh, of firms who are hiring, then we have an opportunity to really change things. So to answer your question really briefly, you know, I I, I think it's open more than it was before, uh, but it's also, you know, it's also closed off in an interesting way to people of color uh, in a way that wasn't before. And so navigating that path is, is I think, our job. I think people like you and I who are in the industry. You know, I, I, you got into VC directly out of undergrad, which is very rare. You know, I mean, that is <laughs> that is incredible that you did that. Um, and the question is, like, what advice would you give them now? It's something I struggle with so much, especially because of my privilege. So. I understand that there are not a lot of jobs um, out of college for for investment analysts in venture. But I also understand the predicament that we just talked about, which is I would never want to recommend someone go do two years in investment banking, go do two years as a PM, do four years of you know your CS degree and then go to a startup to have them go through that six year process and say, you know, I'm ready to get into venture and then they still can't get a job. Or so, even worse than that, they spend six years on that process, get a job in venture, have a horrible experience, realize they never wanted to be a VC, and now the, you know they're they're eight years down the line trying to figure out what do I want to do and how do I do it. Yeah. Um, so it's something I really struggle with with the people I I mentor and the people who, who come to ask me for advice. Generally, what I say is, if there's something you know you want to do, go as hard as possible after that and then change path later. So if you want to do venture, apply to as many venture jobs as possible, talk to as many VCs as possible before you say, okay, I'm gonna follow the path that, that was outlined online or that my mentors told me would, would get me to a venture job. I wonder if we should jump into some of the questions from the, the Black VC uh, Breaking Into Venture group. Let's do that. Yeah, so as a way of context, so the Breaking Into Venture group was the program uh, is a program focused on uh, taking a small cohort of talented black aspiring investors who are young in their careers and helping them feel and become fully prepared for a venture interview and a venture job, um, as well as to make sure we can vouch for them and make those warm intros that we've been talking about all along. So we got a couple of great questions, um, one of which was from, from Kai and Kai asked, what role do colleges and universities play in remedying the issue of lack of diversity in venture capital? 
just this notion that uh, VCs come from Harvard, Stanford, Wharton, and then maybe like five other schools, right? So, um, so, so you know, I, I, I actually wouldn't put in the colleges. I think colleges would love to see their alumni end up in venture. Uh, it's up to us as people in the industry to make sure that we're searching those networks, right? Like, am I going to, um, you know, UC Santa Cruz or, you know, UC Santa Barbara or whatever, or, or Chattanooga State? Am I going to those places or not? Or, you know, or even the, um, I mean, super easy for us and what, what Google has done in a, an amazing way is sort of look for tech talent at HBCUs. You know, so so like so why aren't we doing that as a venture capital um, you know industry? Uh, I think there there is a key lack of coordination across industries uh, across sorry firms within the industry. Um, you know, such that uh, we just we just don't have the same kind of um, coordination uh, that I think you know investment banks had or that law firms had or that accounting firms had in courting people of color and especially HBCUs. So anyway, I, I guess to briefly answer the question, my, my answer would be, it's not up to the to the you know universities. It's up to us to go after the universities and understand how to work with them. We'd love to sort of hear your thoughts there. I I agree with you. I think the onus should be on VCs. I I think the onus should be on VCs because there's a business proposition to hiring diverse talent and and bringing in diverse pipelines. At the same time, I also think there's a valid reason that Stanford and UC Berkeley have done better than universities of the same caliber on the East Coast yeah. at funneling talent into entrepreneurship and venture. And I think part of that, of course, is the alumni network and the location. But I also think a big part of it is the emphasis on entrepreneurship and venture. So having StartX at Stanford or having you know the entrepreneurship classes that Stanford has I think there are a lot of universities that are falling behind on that. Uh, there, a couple of years ago, maybe five, ten years, five, maybe five years ago, uh, I remember there were a lot of college students at HBCUs saying that their their school didn't prioritize tech enough. And what they meant by tech was like, how do I get into Apple? How do I get into Google? Um, and and the schools kind of worked on that, and I think it's gotten a lot better now. Like you're saying, we're now a little bit behind because the next wave of things is already startups and venture. And I think a lot of those HBCUs and and not just HBCUs, but frankly, other colleges on the East Coast haven't been able to integrate that into their curriculum, into their career offerings, into their networks and relationships in a way that gives students at those schools the same opportunities that they would have at a, a Cal or UC Berkeley. I think we had one other question. I'm curious about this. Why are there so few black growth equity investors as opposed to early stage? Oh, don't get me started. Oh no. I uh, did. I th this is started. this is gonna be where like people have to like mute me and cut me off. Um so you know, so first of all, um, you know, I, I think there's a um a preponderance of people of color in private equity. People who went through banking 20 years ago, uh, who later on went to places like Bain Capital and KKR and TPG, and now they're doing investments, um, or 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 even they've done investments and led groups there, and now they're doing their own thing. So I think I think you know we're covered. We're covered at the late stage. Um, you know we haven't traditionally been in venture capital, and all of a sudden we are, right? And the question is, well, so where are we right now, right? So if you look at the folks who have raised funds, um, you know, they've raised funds who who kind of are at the sort of sub fifty million dollar range on average. Now, why is that? Okay, so I gotta I gotta talk to the LP community who funds venture capital investment to sort of get a a, a solid answer on that. I think that what they, what they say back to me is, um, you know, we typically fund first time managers, uh, you know at a certain level of capital and it's going to be sub 50, like we're not going to give them 200 million initially. That might be true. I think if we did some research on it, we'd find a bunch of folks who are not of color who got that first, you know, fund at 200 million. Right. Um, and so the bottom line is, you know, I think people of color, we're breaking to the industry and that means that, you know, as we raise some LPs, they're going to put us in a certain box. It's certainly up to us to make sure that every seed fund, uh, you know, who's managed by a person of color succeeds. 
And, and so, you know, this wasn't the question, but the sort of like tangential point here, and this is what I always talk about, you know, we need people of color investing at the series A and B and C, not just in growth equity, not the C. There, there's a gap here where we don't have people of color who are willing to look at, you know, if you believe people of color will invest in companies led by people of color, where the opportunities aren't obvious to sort of like the mainstream, you know, Maven or whatever, uh, then, then we need people in the middle who will actually follow on and make sure that series C gets an A or that A gets a B and that B gets a C. The worst thing we can imagine uh, and that I worry about all the time is, you know, you've had this, you've had this ecosystem of series C investors whose companies don't get funded at the A. And then LPs just sit back and say, oh, well, we tried this diversity thing. It didn't work. Uh, you know, we'll move on now. Uh, so, you know, I, I, um, I, I, I mean, I, it, as as I talk about kind of, you know, I, I chat with a bunch of folks who are thinking about raising a new fund. And I'm always like, it would be interesting to raise something more on the $200 million side where you're writing $10 million checks. You can fund a series A or B. You can make sure that some of these companies that should survive do survive. Uh, and also make sure that some of these C stage investing funds, you know, are getting the credit that they that they deserve for their investments. So anyway, it's something I think about a lot, and not an easy answer to the question. I'm curious what you think. There's so many layers to this issue. When totally. you talk about the lack of black entrepreneurs, you're talking of okay, you're talking about the lack of black CEOs. Then you're talking about the lack of black entrepreneurs. If you're talking about the lack of black entrepreneurs, you're talking about the lack of funding at the earliest stages. If you're talking about the lack of funding at the early stages, you're talking about the lack of early stage black VCs. If you're then also talking about why don't the existing early stage companies get funded, then you're talking about the later stage VCs. It's also tied together. And then we still haven't even touched on the idea of the lack of black limited partners. Yeah. Um, and even though we're attacking it at different angles, we're still only touching one layer of a, you know, maybe five layered problem. To totally. I mean, I mean, because you can imagine a scenario where I'm investing, you know, I'm, I'm sort of like going on the on the ledge or on the limb to invest in a series A or B. Um, and there's just not a series C or D investor who would pick it up in 18 months, you know, who would sort of invest after me. And, uh, you know, and, and by the way, like, I think quietly, we don't sort of talk about this out loud in our partnerships, but we're all thinking about, you know, who's going to who's going to who's going to invest after us in this company? Um, you know, it's, it's cute to say, oh, we invest in businesses and we don't care about the next round. But the truth is, you know, we're always thinking about who's coming in after us. Um, and, if, you know, and, and, and I think I think that barrier is uh, something that could um, unduly harm folks of color and folks of color who, by the way, like they, they got a shot. They got a shot. The seed and there was a seed investor. And, you know, it seems like things are working, but things won't work if, if we can't kind of, you know, keep the ball moving. And right. maybe one more thing is like, look, I mean, most companies will fail. You know, th this notion that, oh, my pattern recognition is that, you know, I had a few companies that fell and those people were black or Latina or Latino or mm -hmm. whatever, um, you know, it's, it's kind of silly, right? Because we know that it takes probably 10 companies where you invest in, like you need a sufficient sample size to, mm -hmm. even, to even start to claim to be able to make a definitive statistical analysis around what succeeds and doesn't. Um, my, my, my big worry is that, you know, we're sort of having sample sizes of one or two and five years from now or three years from now, you know, we'll walk away saying, oh, well, okay, we, we, we did that. <laughs> you know, we, we, we made that bet, didn't work out. So we can go back to just uh, what we did before. Right, and Tyson, I think part of the challenge you're talking about is the idea that there will be good companies that don't succeed. Totally. Or there will be bad companies that do succeed. And and now if you look at the trends in venture capital where companies are staying private longer and longer and longer and need more and more capital and the unit economics are not necessarily as strong as they used to be in some senses because growth is pushed hard. Would a company or any of these companies have been able to stay private as long as they could if there wasn't an investor down the line, you know, the next um, stage above, above them that believed in them if, if they didn't look the same as them, if they didn't have the same background. Now, I'm not trying to demean any of these entrepreneurs. I'm just saying that to say there are reasons that a company doesn't succeed that aren't based purely on 
will this company be a good investment or will this company be a good exit? I, I think that's totally right. And and so kind of what I would say there, uh, could we have more people of color running companies like that, right? Because they oftentimes are replacing CEOs with new CEOs and why, why aren't people who look like us involved on the board? Why aren't those boards more diverse? Okay. But if you go down uh, kind of one tier below that, there are companies uh, that will be great outcomes. And what they really need is just, uh, they need someone to bet on them at the series D or the series C or whatever it is. They need someone to bet on them and take a, take a, take a big bet and put some cap on the company. And that, that's where bias I think plays out. And, and there's a bunch of companies I could point to sort of to make that point. Um, you know, but, but the bottom line is like, like bias rarely plays out for the breakout companies. For the breakout folks and the breakout companies, uh, it's not an issue. The bias plays in at this c the stage where it's a good company. Maybe it's not like the top tier, but it's in the middle. And of all the companies in that range, you know, be, be, being black or being Latina or being woman or being female or whatever it is, uh, or LGBTQ, like that Other. actually affects the outcome. And that's mm -hmm. the issue. I totally agree. I also think the other challenge is once you have that high quality, not high quality, so you, so you have that, that mid tier investment, it's pretty good, it's not the breakout, but that entrepreneur could be incredible their next time around. And that's a bet totally. that a lot of VC firms make is that someone who does a good company this time will make an incredible company next time. But if you as an entrepreneur have this experience where it feels, and frankly, this is what entrepreneurs are telling me all the time, it feels like it's 10X harder for them to raise than someone else of the same you know, background as them, same metrics as them, they're not going to want to do that again the next time around. To it's to not, it's totally not fun. Agree. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. And, and, you know, you think about people who are, you know, to, to be in VC nowadays, you had to have a career in something else. Um, why would I leave my career, which, which is successful, to bring in a VC uh, and face these structural problems, right? Sydney. Great to catch up with you. Uh, really appreciate your perspective. Great to you know kind of spend the time and um, and, and as always, of course, know that GV myself we're always uh, in your corner. We're advocates. Uh, let us know when we can help out. Thank you so much, Tyson. This was incredible. Let's do it again. Take care. Bye bye.